of the ROI. I have found when you're dealing at least with larger organizations, risk is a huge thing. Um, the key here is to show that it actually reduces risk um, because you're releasing a little bit at a time. They don't believe that though. Well, They're all pushing for you know, release windows every two weeks, every month. But even that's a start. And, and, and if you're doing two months, take it to a month. If you're doing two months, see if you can take it to two weeks. Um, I've seen my, my organization is coming around. They're realizing that, you know, we've been spending all this money doing these rewrites and stuff, and, and it's not been working out. Um, another thing that helps is, is separate your deployment from your release. So using, like, feature toggles and branching by abstraction, you can actually show them that, hey, a code base can be stable, even though there's multiple different things going on. Be and because let's say something goes wrong, you introduce a regression bug, you just flip it off. That's really powerful to an organization when they see how easy it is to, because that's all about, you know, they're trying to save face and they're trying to, to make sure things are easily fixable. Yeah. So I, I agree with almost all of the tools and practices you discussed here, but I'm not sure I buy the premise that smaller code releases are smaller risk. Okay. Especially in certain deployments where... So what deployments are you thinking then? Well, I mean, if you're running a huge e-commerce site like Apple Store, or if you're running something mission critical like something that runs HIV blood tests, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've done both of these things, and even a, a small snippet of code change can have huge ramifications for the company. That, that is true. Um, and HIV blood tests, is a, I think it's a unique situation where you might even take a more waterfall approach because you need more levels of testing around it. Or you, we still run them agile. Okay. Fake agile, depending on what oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, at the same time, like four lines of code can completely change a result, and suddenly right. your company loses billions of dollars. I think there are certain high risk changes, but I think uh, likeliness that one line change is going to be less risky than a two line change, and it, and it, it can depend on your architecture. And that's, you know, you can actually design systems where that's more likely to be the case. Um, you know, if everything's in a giant method, uh, then one line change can be devastating. Because it's like, I depend on that, you know. In that kind of environment, you want really heavy unit, automated unit testing, and you need test engineers to go over it oh, time so, by time to make sure that everything. Here's an example from the other day. Uh, working on an e commerce site. Um, a couple lines of CSS made a button slide off screen. Mm -hmm. Automated tests don't catch it. They're like, oh, I can still push the button because I'm using JavaScript to push buttons. With, you know. It depends upon what your the, some of the GUI tests we use will catch. Right. I mean, it depends on your testing tools. Yes. Uh, some there are def definitely tools that can catch it, but in that sort of thing, I mean, you roll it out, somebody notices it's not working, you roll it back. There's 60 minutes of downtime on a major e-commerce site. That's a lot yeah. of money. I think what you're talking about is a one-line change. I think, okay, too, you got to be careful if you're doing what's called high-risk changes, uh, certain database migrations, and changes that affect your, all your conventions or your, just like a CSS style sheet. The way that we do release, release testing, we use, we use Linux containers, which we do the same thing with virtual machines. Every time we will release an entire um, virtual machine, in our case, Linux clusters, is built, pushed into the server farm. Mm -hmm. We can instantly I mean, we, we do virtual machines as well, but I mean, you got to clear Akamai caches. That's half an hour. Um, for your specific problem, um, I think a feature toggle works great here. Uh, whatever loads your CSS, you could use like a bundler or, or whether it's just a simple reference. Uh, if you're going to make a change to the CS, because anything where you can affect multiple pages at once I think is a high risk change, is you can toggle that and say if this is true use this old style sheet and if this is true use the new one and then if you have a, a, an issue like that you can just flip that off and, and it's back. Because I understand what, I understand that sort of thing, even one line can. Um, but the, I think it's not just the lines of code, I think it's the type of change too, you, you know, when you categorize the changes. So yeah. when, you when you mentioned feature toggles, do you mean logic in the running software to say what exactly yeah. what if you get that wrong? That is something that can happen. But it's usually an if statement. Those are, it, this 
right is uh, it's it requires a certain level of programmer discipline, just like continuous integration does. You can't do branching by abstraction if no one knows how to abstract. And with feature toggles, you have to have a devil of discipline to say, okay, I'm gonna you know put this only on my entry points on the necessary places, and I'm not gonna you know it has to have the discipline to not touch the old code, and then wrap it around. Um, we, but I yeah. We used to do that and ended up finding more bugs getting introduced because you, features that you didn't fully understand their dependency started mm -hmm. introducing other subtleties and the config started getting... Oh, that's interesting. Because you got to clean them up too. I mean, if you're going to put feature toggles and abstraction, then you, you also have to have a, a way to track, say, this is an end date too. And that, you can see that. And you've got to be able yeah. to know all of the dependencies changing something like that's causing. All right. Well, I hear you. into things where you thought you had an isolated feature mm -hmm. and something else that you didn't realize depended upon it. And we find it much simpler instead to have multiple branches built. Okay. And you pick which, virtual, which environment, which machine build you wanted. And with you did it by machine build, like virtual machine build? Yes. But on like code branch, like a... Um, yes, we ultimately end up with the end of our build process, builds a Linux container that you could basically put into production now. Mm -hmm. um, because we find too many other problems with, front, as you said, complete machine configuration management. It was just easier to tell the production folks, okay, we're swapping, here's today's machines. If you have a problem, all you need to do is switch back to yesterday's. Yeah. Right. You I, I agree. Worry about what version of the operating system, what patches went into it, what versions of what libraries, what config files. Yeah. The I, production folks see. I, I think that feature toggles, I mean, if, if your architecture is set up where dependencies are prevalent and it and it's, um, it's easy to, to, to get dependency on each other. I guess feature toggles alone aren't going to fix that. But I think how, how you get into, you know, dependency issues largely I've seen are related to the architectural setup, you know. Um, like we had an issue where some of our running bash jobs depended on the full stack of our infrastructure and that was silly. Like we had to set it up in code. But then when we moved to a more web API based HTTP, all of a sudden now we have actual the runtime dependency matched you know, our conceptual dependency and our deployment dependency lined up and that's less, less issues started happening. Um, so that, uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm just, uh, we're at 9.50, so um, I don't know if the next presenter's in here, but I want to let him give a chance to set up to And he's the guy doing firearms, so. <laughs> you gotta no, I gotta be fast. <laughs> go ahead. How would you tell when you can't get too far, when are you really too often, or when you have too much, is there, like with Agile or anything else, what are some of the things when it gets not to be a positive ROI? I, I think that's a good problem to have. Um, on, honestly, I think having a guideline when, product, when uh, operations is telling you, when they can't train their people fast enough or something like that, because you want to make sure that you're, all our goal in the end is to align our technical constraints with our business constraints. SOA, microservices, all, the, all Agile, all that stuff is an attempt to do that. So, so when you know operations is telling you we want you to release at this rate because this is as fast as we can handle it, I would say that's because it's too. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. What was that? When you can run at the speed of the business, you're good for the moment. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you can change the speed of the business. That's the dream. All right. I really appreciate you guys coming out. This is my first presentation ever in my life. So, really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. To